This is my third lesson on uh, introduction to integral calculus. In the first lesson, I spoke about integral calculus as the problem of obtaining the area of a plane region. And in this, in the second lesson, I spoke about integral calculus as the antiderivative. And my analogy for integral calculus is the analogy of a coin. The coin has two faces. One face is about obtaining the area of a plane region, and the other one is about, <coughs> excuse me, getting the antiderivative of a function. So we are not yet done with the introduction. So integration as the area of a plane region. Uh, this is our notation for getting the integral of a function. Okay, look at that. It is the integral of f of x dx from a to b. You call a the lower limit of integration. You call b the upper limit of integration. Or you can call it as the interval. Okay, so the interval where you are integrating your, your function. So as an area of a plane region, this is how I, ex I, I explain to you the idea behind integration. Okay, so let's say, for example, we are tasked to get what is the area of the region bounded by this curve, bounded below by the horizontal axis from, from this one, okay, from this, uh, or between these two vertical lines. Okay, so we will get the area of that. So it's not really a regular polygon. It's not a polygon. But we can use this. Okay, we can use this. What we will do is we will lay down or inscribe pieces of fine rectangles, narrow rectangles, so that uh, they will fit into the region that we are working on. And then after that, what, what we will do is we will get the area of each of this. What is the area of of each of these rectangles and then we will get their sum. The true area of the region, okay, the true area of this region is going to be, okay, it's going to be the limit of the sum, okay, the sum of the areas of those polygons. I ranges from 1 to n as n approaches infinity, okay. And if this limit exists, if this limit exists, that is our interpretation of the integral. The integral of f of x dx integrated from a to b. So this is how we, we, were, we did it last time, okay? So let's say, for example, we are interested to know what is the area of the region that is bounded above by this curve, okay? This is a parabola bounded below by the horizontal axis from from 0 to 3 and what we did last time is we we drew rectangles we lay down rectangles in this way and we will get the sum of the areas of these rectangles uh, that's going to be our estimate for the area of this plane region and so this is how we do it the area of that plane region is approximately equal to the summation of a sub i, a sub i is the area of a rectangle, i ranges from 1 to n. If the limit exists, okay, if that limit exists, then that is the true area of the, of the uh, plane region that is bounded by these curves. So this is like a numerical approach to getting the area of a region. But of course, you know that you cannot implement a code wherein n approaches infinity. Okay, so you must decide. Uh, your code, okay, your computer program must end somewhere. Okay, so n cannot really go on to infinity. So I'm going to illustrate again the idea behind integration as the area of a plane region. Okay. Estimate the area of the plane region bounded by this function. f of x is equal to 3 times e to the negative x squared, bounded below by the horizontal axis in the interval negative 1 to 2. Partition the interval in, in, into 3. So we shall have 3, 
three partitions. Okay, how do you erase this? Okay, anyway, uh, I haven't used my pen pineapple pen in a very long time. I don't know anymore how to erase this. Okay, so we shall obtain the area using this. It's going to be the sum. Oh, by the way, this is the graph of your function uh, f of x is equal to 3 times e to the, to the negative x squared. Okay, and we will get the area of the region that is bounded by the curve from negative 1. Okay, we will start here to 2. Okay, from negative 1 to 2. And bounded above by this curve. Okay, so, so we will partition it into 3 intervals. Okay, from negative 1 to 0, 0 to 1, and then 1 to 2. And we will lay down our strips of rectangles. Okay, so this is going to be our initial estimate for the area of that plane region. Uh, by the way, M sub i is the midpoint, the midpoint of your interval. So what we are going to do here is we will obtain the sum of each of these rectangles and we will get the sum. So the area of that, uh, the estimate area of that region is going to be the sum of, this is your function, okay? 3 times e to the negative x squared. This is your width. Okay, these are rectangles. The area is length times width. Okay, y1, y1, look at that. So the length of that is 1. The length of this is also 1. And the length of that is also 1. I'm going to factor out 3. 3 is a common factor, okay? So we will evaluate the function at the midpoints of the interval. That will give you the height. That will give you the height of the rectangles. Okay, from here to there will give you the height. So this is length, okay, length from here to there times width plus length, okay, length times width and then length times width. And this is our initial estimate for the area of this plane region, 5.06 square units. Now, obviously, we have an error here at this space here. Uh, those space represent the error. Okay, So it would be better if we can cover that space. Now, we will do it again. But this time, we will do it by constructing trapezoids. Instead of a rectangle, we will do it with the trapezoids or through the trapezoids. So we will get the area of this, uh, of each of these trapezoids and then we will obtain their sum. Okay, so how do you get the area of a trapezoid? So it's equal to this, one half times uh, the base, the lower base plus the, uh, the upper base times height, one half. Th this is like getting the average length. What is the average length of the bases? That is how you interpret this. That is how you get the average of two numbers, a plus b divided by 2. So in effect, what you are doing here is you are getting the average length of the base. So this one can be confusing. This is your trapezoid, okay? This is your trapezoid. So what is the base there? Uh, okay, this is not the base. This is the length. This is the height. This is the height of the trapezoid. Because normally when we draw trapezoids, we do it this way. So this is the lower base, this is the upper base, and this is the height. In this case, B1 is F of A, okay? You can call, call this F of A, this is A. F of A is that one, the value of your function when A is negative 1. F of B, B E is 0, excuse me. And so F of B, which is the length of, of, the, of this base, that's going to be F of B f of a plus f of b, these are the standing, standing bases, the average of that, times height. This is the height. This is the height. So it's going to be equal to, oh by the way, uh, where, uh, where did this come from? 2 times this. Well, if you were to look at these two, two trapezoids, they are in fact congruent. They are congruent. 
Okay, so I will just get the area of one trapezoid times two, and then add the area of the small trapezoid. Okay, how do you clear this? Okay, and then simplifying this, the area is equal to 7.48 square units. When you are estimating the area of a plane region, we are not restricted to rectangular strips. We can use we can use trapezoids. Now we will now go to the part of integration as anti-differentiation. So the word anti-differentiation obviously has something to do with getting the derivative. And that is what you studied in math math four differential calculus. So integration is the reverse process of differentiation. Okay, integral does what you did with getting the derivative. And the connection between the two, between the integral and the derivative is embodied in this theorem. We call that the fundamental theorem of calculus. This is how I illustrated integration and differentiation. Let's say, for example, I have a function f of x plus c. I'm going to feed it into a machine that will give you the derivative of your function. And this is the result. f prime of x is equal to g of x. What I'm going to do is I will return this derivative into the machine and it will produce this. It will return it back to the original function. So the process at the bottom is what you call differentiation. And so when you, re when you return the output back, to the machine, you call it anti-differentiation. And so this is what happens with anti-differentiation. You are getting the integral of this function, which is in fact the derivative of f of x. Since uh, integration, we can look at integration as anti-differentiation. Okay, so I hope that you can now answer this because you studied differential calculus last semester. You ought to know this. So if that is so, if, if integration is anti-differentiation, then tell me what is the integral of e to the x dx? What is that function such that when you get its derivative will give you this? Okay. Obviously, it's this function because the derivative of e to the x plus c is equal to e to the x. This one is equal to zero. Okay, so look at that. Look at that. The integral of e to the x dx is equal to e to the x plus c. How about the second one? Letter b. What is the integral of 2? times x dx. What is that function so that when you get the derivative of that function, it will give you 2x? Okay, obviously it's this one. Why? Because the derivative of x squared plus c is equal to, okay, power rule, you break down to 2 times x plus, okay, the derivative of a constant with respect to x is 0. So it's 2x. Letter C. What is the integral of sine of x dx? What is that function so that when you get its derivative, it will give you sine of x? Is it sine of x? Okay, no, because the derivative of sine of x, okay, plus C, is equal to cosine of x plus 0. So it's cosine of x. So, so this one is not the antiderivative of, or uh, yeah, that's not uh, equal to the integral of sine of x dx. Is it cosine of x? Well, let's check it out. The derivative of, of cosine of x plus c is equal to negative sine of x. The negative sine of x, but this one is just sine of x. Okay, so what do you think is the... Uh, anti-derivative. What is the value of the integral of uh, sine of x dx? Well, it's going to be this. 
Okay, so let us show it. So the derivative with respect to x of this function, negative cosine of x plus c is equal to, okay, you will just leave the negative sign, negative of negative sine of x plus 0. And this is equal to sine of x. So this is equal to, to the integral of sine of x dx. It's equal to negative cosine of x. Uh, sorry. Letter D. What is the integral of e to the x plus the square of second x dx? So which of these functions whose derivative is equal to this? Okay. So obviously we must choose only from these two functions because the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. But what function will give me a derivative that is equal to the square of second of x? It is this one, okay? Because the derivative with respect to x of e to the x plus tangent of x plus c, oh sorry, this should be here, is equal to e to the x plus, okay, square of the second of x. So obviously you can see now that integration will require you to go back to differentiation. It will require you to go back to differentiation and in particular to remember the derivatives. You have a set of formula for derivatives for the cosine function, sine function, tangent, and ln. You must remember that. Okay. So we are only on, uh, on the part that is an introduction. This is only an introduction to integration. We, we can look at integration as the task of obtaining the area of a plane region. We can also look at it as getting the antiderivative.